I am really happy and grateful to be back in this room with this audience. These two uh, lectures in the series are um, about still life, which was something the 17th century painters of Flanders and Holland excelled at. Uh, they painted and sold them in great quantities, uh, quantities in Holland. They exported them to well-to-do collectors all over Europe. Still lifes were high in popularity, despite the fact that they were actually low in prestige. In the opinion of writers on art during the entire century, still life ranked at the bottom of the various categories of art. At the top were history paintings, pictures of important events in history or scripture or myth. They were seen as more challenging intellectually and harder to do. You had to represent human bodies and expressions that had to be studied from the living model. At the beginning of the century, uh, Carol van Mander wrote that still life painters were the foot soldiers in the army of artists. Nevertheless, writers did admire the best still life painters for their skill at mimicking the look of their subjects so vividly. Still life flourished in the real world of making and selling. As one recent writer put it, still life thrived in a theoretical vacuum. The pictures were fascinating to look at and at times an absolute wonder. Even beyond their uncanny realistic surfaces, these pictures have an ingenious structure and a play with form revealed by light that artists in later centuries have always understood without consulting treatises. This large a painting by Deheim uh, in the Louvre, uh, for instance, was a starting point for Henri Matisse, who studied its structure and made his own large version of it, changing its colors, reorganizing it, and flattening it. Dutch and Flemish painters believed that their still lives, like history paintings, could convey ideas, that they could convey truths, and their customers did too. Still lives were often uh, what I've called in my title, food for thought. They weren't just for looking at, they were for thinking about and meditating upon. In 1614, the writer Rumer Fisser wrote in a book of emblems, there is nothing empty or useless in things. He meant that you could look at ordinary things around you, and with a little imagination, they could lead you to some truth about life, or some cliché, about good behavior or bad, about material desires, and the possible danger they posed, posed for the soul. So, for example, if you observe a mother combing her child's hair to remove lice, you might think that that ordinary daily act, ordinary for the 17th century anyway, um, that was performed by dutiful mothers, and you might see it as a symbol, see it as virtuous, the way Rumer Fisser did. He offered the comb as a symbol, a sign that purification itself is an ornament for a woman, perhaps the only ornament she really needs. Still life painting was often intended not just to be pleasing, but to instruct to give people something edifying to ponder. Now, it's hard for us today to imagine just how strong this taste for moralizing was. Uh, to quote one writer, the Dutch had a relentless addiction to taking everyday things and each either searching out their inherent inner meanings, perhaps extracting a moral lesson, or conversely, using them as vehicles to be loaded with ready-made ideas. This way of thinking about paintings is going to come up more than once in these lectures. When we say still life, we're using a term that was coined by the Dutch themselves, still leven, meaning pictures of things that are either incapable of movement or that lack a soul. The range of things that painters depicted got steadily wider, and by the middle of the 17th century, it included many categories including vanitas uh, images, like this one, about the brevity of life, so-called breakfast pieces with food and lots of it, 
kitchen still lives, the implements and vessels and food, pipe smoking pieces with the necessary apparatus, arrangements of plain or very fancy wares and food, fruit pieces, compositions of dead game and weapons, and, sorry, pictures of dead fish. It was also a large category of flower still lives, so large that I'm going to deal with it in a separate lecture. Each of these categories has subcategories, and each had specialists, and so that in many cases artists could make a living painting just a single type. The same kind of specialization, by the way, that's true of the varieties of landscape. And these lectures, you're going to hear me using the words Dutch and Flemish. By Dutch, I'm referring to the people living in the northern Netherlands, uh, here that have been ingeniously fitted into a map of the 17th century in the shape of their mascot, a lion. The seven provinces uh, of the New Republic that had become independent, de facto at least, from their Spanish overlords in 1609, and had built a huge and growing economy from trade with the rest of Europe and from imports from various trading stations throughout the world from finance, from insurance, and certain manufacturers. They belong mainly to Calvinist and other Protestant sects with a strong Catholic minority. By Flemish, I mean people in the southern Netherlands, people living down here, uh, <laughs> south of the lion's <laughs> hindquarters. <laughs> this is a map made in, by the Dutch. I, uh, <laughs> Ten uh, provinces remained Spanish and mainly Catholic, and they were also prosperous enough through types of commerce like those of the breakaway provinces to their north. There was a fitful war going on, but during much of the time the border between the Netherlands, north and south, was porous. They had the same language, and in most ways they belonged to a single cultural sphere. Early in the century, in conditions that made them better off, um, and free uh, to practice their Protestant religion, uh, they came to the north. There was also patronage for artists in the great cities of Antwerp and Brussels, in particular from the churches. German still life painters also contributed, as you'll see, uh, contributed to still life. In fact, the earliest independent still lifes we have, uh, like this one by the German Bartel Breun, uh, carry the sobering reminder written on the page here, everything passes with death. Death is the ultimate limit of everything. That's a saying attributed to Lucretius, the Roman poet and philosopher, and endlessly paraphrased in Christian sermons, Catholic and Protestant, ever since. But this isn't a Christian motto, it's a pagan one. Ancient literary and philosophical te texts uh, had been rediscovered by Italian scholars and penetrated northern Europe by the middle of the 16th century, loosening the grip of Catholic orthodoxy. At the same time, there were other great discoveries, in particular a new approach to science based on observation and classification. Natural science was one of the ancestors of still life painting, and some of the illustrators of animals and insects and botanical specimens, like this one, uh, Joris Hufnagel, uh, were also painters. The upsurge of painting in the 17th century was paralleled by the collecting of things, not just precious objects made by craftsmen, but also and especially specimens of natural history that were evidence of the endless wonders of nature. For an entire century, European seafarers had been exploring Asia and Africa and the New World and bringing back amazing new material year after year. This was the great age, in fact, of what the Germans called the Kunst und Wunderkammer, the cabinet of curiosities. Scholars and artists worked for princes and highborn patrons all over Europe to collect and classify and show the finest and most curious specimens. If you look around the private museum here of Ferrante Imperato in Naples, uh, pictured in his enormously influential book of 1599. He was a geologist, so there are minerals and ores, 
and curious formations in these cabinets. But the emphasis in, the, its emphasis in this room is on birds and sea creatures, as you see on the ceiling, uh, some tips uh, for interior decoration <laughs> for people who are running out of space. Before we return to still life in the Netherlands, I want to make a short side trip to Italy and to Spain, where still life was a minor specialty, but occasionally so brilliant and influential you can't pass it by, even in a lecture on Dutch painting. About the time that Joris Hufnagel was drawing those insects and fruit on a tiny scale, this painter uh, from Cremona, Vincenzo Campi, was spreading it all out, uh, life-size, fruit of all kinds, offered for sale by a good-looking market girl with a skirt full of peaches. This is about abundance, and also about the marvelous variety of grapes and figs and cherries and other fruits that had been cultivated by clever humans, not merely gathered wild. This is a picture uh, that looks in two directions. It looks back to its inspiration, these market scenes by Flemish painters a generation earlier. On the top, the um, sort of claustrophobic, uh, in-your-face uh, butcher stalls of Peter Artsen, and below that, the untidy uh, displays of fruit and vegetables by Joachim Burgelaar. And Campi looks forward uh, to Caravaggio. It was Campi's still lifes that evidently suggested to the young painter Caravaggio that he might paint a basket of fruit all by itself, not on a table, but on a ledge at our eye level against a mottled, mottled uh, plaster wall. The fruits and the leaves have blemishes and insect holes. They're unidealized. They're as unidealized as Caravaggio's actors uh, in his scene uh, of Christ revealing himself at Emmaus, where, as you can see, he puts another basket of fruit on the table, upstaging the action and doing it with an audacious bit of trickery, making it seem to hang out over the edge into what looks like our space. And that sharpens our sense of actually being present at the scene. Now Caravaggio didn't set off a wave of still life painting in Italy, but his example spread, and spread to Spain uh, as well, where older artists uh, like this one had been practicing an indigenous brand of still life, uh, perfect fruits and vegetables symmetrically displayed against a dark background. This is all literal and prosaic, to our eyes quaint, uh, almost folk-like. The remarkable thing is that just at the same time this painting uh, was created, a composition so stunning in its simplicity and so believable in each of the five fruits and vegetables that we wonder if this was really maybe how things were hung up uh, and laid out in Spanish kitchens. But then we shake that off and we see it as complete artifice contrived to make this sort of improbable, extremely graceful cascade of forms through space. This artist, also Spanish, places delicate glass and ceramic forms across the surface in a simple but calculated rhythm, alternating light and dark, hardly even suggesting the space around. And this artist, in turn, made it possible in the 1630s for Zurbaran to give ordinary subjects a quality of monumentality and a very subtle richness of surface and color. There's something about this display for many people that has a kind of numinous character, as though these things were meant as gifts from God. It reminds you of what St. Teresa of Avila said to herself, uh, that she never entered a kitchen without, as she said, thinking that the Lord is walking among the pots and pans. When we compare a very fine, simple Dutch still life of the same time to Zorbaran, we see a big difference. It has a luminous envelope of space, a complex composition, and a suggestion that people have already been here. The Spanish do without these complications and put across something that is perfectly wonderful but in a different way. Now, um, back to northern Europe, where we left off. Uh, painted still lives began with this ancient theme, as you heard, of the brevity of human life and the foolishness of our attachment to material things and sense pleasures. 
This is an idea that had a long life in the Netherlands. Uh, and on the right is the first picture of its kind from the beginning of the century by the brilliant Dutch painter Jacob de Geen. He invents a symbolic language beginning with the oldest symbol of all, that skull, and adds a flower, symbol of beauty and transience. In this case, it's a tulip of that gorgeous striped kind that was being developed right then in the Leiden Botanical Garden. Flanking the tulip uh, is another vase with a bit of smoke coming out of it. Well, these are both Old Testament images, as many members of the audience would know right away. Not this audience, but the audience that the picture was painted for. <laughs> Sorry. Um, in the book of Job, man comes forth like a flower and is cut down. And also, my days are consumed like smoke. Above the skull is a bubble, another short-lived object of beauty. And flanking the niche are sort of fictive sculptures here uh, of Herac uh, Heraclitus and Democritus, uh, the weeping and laughing philosophers of antiquity. The skull rests on some wisps of dry grass, which recall the prophet Isaiah, all flesh is grass, all the goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, because the Spirit of the Lord blows upon it. And on the sill, there are coins of the Habsburg Empire, which the Dutch were in the process of defeating. Should anybody miss the moral of all this, carved into the top of the arch are the words humana vana, right? Beauty, pleasure, riches, worldly power, all of them come to an end. I'm here I'm going to introduce uh, the artist of my title today, Peter Klaas, who took up this theme but didn't pick up de Gein's diagrammatic way of treating it. Instead, we have, uh, instead of this niche, uh, I should say we have a table and the skull sits on a book and papers bridged by a feather quill a swooping down to an ink holder. It's a kind of process and product. There's a wine glass uh, tipped over. Someone's been here drinking and writing, but it's all finished. The wine uh, of life is gone. In the oil lamp, the flame of life has guttered out. What strikes us is how plausible this all looks, how persuasive the glass seems with those reflections of the windows of the room that we're in and the shine of light on the red glaze uh, of the earthenware lamp and the crackly texture of the paper. We also see how subtle the shadows are everywhere we look. We see a dance of diagonals in two directions, here, 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 and we see the skull turned off-center. But what looked like a simple setup at first is actually barely in balance. Starting with the glass, you wonder what keeps it there. It could roll off with the least movement, just as the quill could fall with a breath of air. I think with this arrangement, the painter is suggesting that life is not only short, but precarious as well. This kind of still life appears in many hundreds of inventories in Holland in the 17th century under the title Vanitas. And Peter Klaas made elaborate variations on the theme. Uh, the setup here has some of the same stuff as the picture we just saw, plus a, a violin whose sounds, after all, are heard for only a brief moment and then fade, like life itself. There's a pocket watch down there, too, uh, a pretty new invention that appears in many still lifes through the centuries, counting out the hours. The novelty um, here is the glass ball, a stand-in for the soap bubble that you saw in the painting by Duchesne a moment ago. It reflects the still life on the table. You can see the violin and other things. It reflects the still light on the table and the room beyond with its door and window and the artist himself at the easel painting the very picture we're looking at. So the painter is showing off here, demonstrating that his mind is nimble enough 
to employ two systems of describing the world at once, conventional one-point perspective for the table and spherical wide-angle projection in the globe. He lets the spectator comprehend more of the world around him than she could with the painter's help. Well, this is a trick Klaus doesn't perform again. He turns from this kind of hermetic and self-referential world and becomes a kind of virtuoso of consumption. He paints tables that appear ready for us, the viewers, to what exactly? Not sit down, because there are no chairs or even space for chairs, let alone plates for us. Well, is it a buffet? If so, people have been there already. <laughs> They've been at it. It's a bit of a mess. The pie's been broken into. Bits are scattered around. Olives have escaped the dish and are on the tablecloth. No, this is a display of good things for us to look at, arranged with no functional order, but with a lot going on visually. There are shapes and colors and textures with terrific variety, organized symmetrically. Um, their basic shapes, of course, are ovals, which you can see everywhere. There's a vertical center line uh, here, and to the left of that, the candy plate, over here to the right, the bread, to the left of it, again, the olives, and oops, where is my Tinkerbell? There. Uh, the olives, and to the right, another plate, and so forth. A serving spoon uh, to the left, and to the knife to the right, not incidentally, diagonals that converge, making a big triangle. So formally, the picture is tightly thought through. We get a very good view of this layout on the table because our point of view is rather high. We're looking down at the table. And I think certain things are there just to intrigue you. The plate uh, that sticks out beyond the edge of the table, uh, kind of slightly unnerving, and lets the artist show off his skill. And there's the lemon, which in still lives all through the century often uh, steals the show. Most often, the lemon has been partly peeled uh, by somebody with the skill uh, to make the peel form a kind of continuous helix. The peeled lemon, in fact, becomes a kind of, kind of compulsory figure in competition among still life painters for grace and precision. The nubbly top is already sliced, so we can savor the look of the translucent lemon flesh with the pewter actually visible through it and see the lemon's reflection in the surface. The more you look, the more you see. Well, if this is food for thought, um, what did the artist want his audience to think? About indulgence and its dangers? That's been suggested, and some people might indeed have thought that way. I, I imagine that ideas about order and disorder might arise, but the likeliest train of thought, I think, is that this food won't last long. The pie and the bread and the olives and the lemon will be eaten, or be given to servants, or be thrown out to decompose. They'll be gone. But not the painting. The painting will survive, and it'll go on teasing and amazing people long after the food and the people who ate it are gone. So I think the painting embodies, among other things, an ancient adage educated Dutch people knew from a treatise by the physician Hippocrates. It goes, life is short, art is long. This is one of the truths that painters of food and flower still lives invite us to consider again and again and again. Well, there's another maxim you might expect to apply here, the famous advice of Horace, carpe diem, seize the day. Pluck fruit while it's ripe and don't trust till tomorrow. That's actually not a sentiment that was repeated by the Dutch, although they knew it very well. Their Christian beliefs favored restraining yourself today in the expectation of a reward tomorrow. Peter Klaas didn't invent this kind of still life we've been looking at with food and drink on the table. He inherited it, and he made it more complex and subtle. This is a work by Osius Beert, an Antwerp painter, the previous generation, who sold a lot of pictures in the northern Netherlands and abroad. 
Um, here, the delicate wine glasses in the background and the silver uh, tatsa with expensive, uh, fancy uh, baked goods tell us that we're a rung or two up the socioeconomic ladder uh, from Peter Klaas. Somebody's nibbled at the candy here and left traces. But everything, otherwise, uh, everything seems to be pretty much in order and ready for inspection. Now, you may think a little too much in order. Uh, Beert uh, here is playing a game of ovals. Uh, he may have been the one actually who invented this sort of game with form, but he isn't the virtuoso at it that Peter Klaas is. The setup on the table here was a formula that other artists did use over and over again. In other words, a convention. If we took it as a real-life meal, uh, we'd be wrong. I mean, as one writer has put it, still lifes like this would lead us to believe that meals were eaten alone, standing at the corner of a table, and always beginning with the peeling of fruit. <laughs> Peter Klaas's paintings are still artifice, but they masquerade more convincingly as the real thing. They reach a new level of subtlety. If you look at this painting, and particularly if you look up close, and look at this sheen uh, on the nautil nautilus shell here, for instance, and look at the turkey feathers behind it, which are flicked on with soft, detached touches of the brush. And look at the uh, crust of the roll down here, which he makes crumbly by scattering yellow ochre highlights across the surface. This is a kind of modest form of virtuosity. He gives a different kind of attention, though, to the expensive collector's piece uh, here, which is a, a shell of a chambered nautilus brought from the South Pacific, then put into a silver gilt mount made for it by a Dutch or German goldsmith. There's also a large Chinese bowl. These things speak directly about wealth and indirectly about how they got to the Netherlands, a long, dangerous, profitable voyage to Asia that brought them. Over on the left, uh, Klaas places an exquisite pewter pitcher and a wine glass. And these have soft reflections of the room, each reflection complex in a different way on account of the curvature of the surfaces. Up in the galleries here at Yale is another of these paintings by Peter Klaas, uh, with a ham in the middle, with mustard over here, sausages, wine, a basket of cheeses, with butter. This is what the Dutch called a breakfast piece in inventories of the period, an ontbeetje. Even now, a Dutch breakfast still looks like lunch to us, and vice versa. This uh, composition gets extra activity from the bunched up white tablecloth. The game of visual balance is trickier here, not just because of the huge wine glass at the left, but also by the Chinese dish of butter that's balanced very precariously on top of the basket of cheeses. These tricks, again, make it clear that the entire setup is not something we'd come across in a Dutch house at breakfast or any other time. It's contrived by the artist for effect. Let me add something more at this point about the low standing of still life in the 17th century. That prejudice against still life came along with art theories the Dutch acquired from the Italian writers of the late Renaissance. For example, Giorgio Vasari. Painting inanimate objects could never challenge an artist or his audience the way that human figures could. Dutch rep writers repeated this as truth. Dutch artists painted inanimate objects anyway, and people bought them. Writers by, by like Van Mander and Samuel van Hoogstraten gave plenty of instructions to figure painters for composing and painting, but they didn't give any tips at all to still life painters. No do's and don'ts. I'm, I'm convinced, though, that still life painters took advice that writers intended for figure painters and applied it to their work. The main objective of painting since the Renaissance was to fool the eye into accepting 
the painting as the illusion of uh, accepting the illusion of reality. According to Hochstraten, a perfect picture is like a mirror of nature, which makes things do not that do not exist appear to do so, and deceives in a permissible, pleasant, and praiseworthy way. So you create a version of nature, and you earn praise for its naturalness and your skill at imitation. Dutch writers prescribed clear, strong composition, which they called ordonnancy, or fitting together, beeinfuchinge, or ordering, schikkinge. Van Mander said about successful compositions that are, that are like music, when the different sounds of singers and players make harmony. So in the art of painting, many various figures do the same. I think instead of that phrase, various figures, we swapped it for various things on a table, Van Mander would not protest. Writers tied composition, the arrangement of things, to the pictorial space that the artist created through perspective and color and lighting and the positioning of things. That entire combination of techniques gave the painting its howding, a term that evidently meant plausible form and position in space. I think you can actually see how painters of still life, like Peter Klaas, took advice that had been aimed at figure painters. Now, this is a biblical subject here on the right by Salomon de Bray, who was a member of the Harlem Painters Guild together with Peter Klaas. It shows a scene from Genesis where Joseph has has left uh, Israel, gone to Egypt, where he became very grand. He became viceroy to the Pharaoh, but was estranged from his father and brothers. When they came to see him, Joseph graciously put aside old grievances with his family and received the family. The power of Debray's composition comes from the way he groups the figures, legibly, creates a believable stage space with a platform and uses light and shade and harmonious, subdued colors. Well, that is what Peter Klaas does. He's got a tip completely different purpose, but similar techniques. He puts his main actors, the turkey and the fruit, off-center, forming a large mass. He uses color and emphasis for variety. He uses the eye-catching device of the cantilevered uh, lemon plate uh, here to emphasize the illusion of space towards us, as the boy and the dog do in the foreground of Debray's composition. Well, I'm going to leave Peter Klaas and return to him in a minute or so. I want to introduce Clara Peters, an important artist of her generation and of that of Osias Beert. We met both of them, oh, both of them originating in Antwerp. This may actually be Clara Peters herself, as serving as the model for an allegory of vanity. She's dressed in very old-fashioned costume for the time, and she has a table full of rich things, jewels and coins, and two specimens of goldsmith's work, uh, one tipped over, and beyond it a covered cup of great, great splendor. She looks off stage, and she holds a pocket watch. Time is passing. Life may be good now, the message is, but it will go the way of the flowers in the vase. And it may be as gone as, it may be gone as quickly uh, as the bet that somebody placed on the roll of those dice. And life is like a soap bubble, as one floating next to her head. It will pop. So you've seen this apparatus before in the grim-looking painting by, by Duhaine. The imagery was popular, as I've said this. Many, many versions. Here's a more spacious version by an Amsterdam painter, Jacob Duck. Table loaded with symbols of wealth and knowledge and passing time. And there's the skull again. The whole repertory of folly and futility. The message is exemplified by the gorgeously dressed woman who seems pleased at all this and doesn't appear to be learning the lesson one bit. The most moving allegory of vanity at this period is actually an imaginary scene of repentance. The picture by the great French artist Georges de Latour of Mary Magdalene, the reformed sinner who's shed her fancy clothes and sits with a skull in her lap 
and books on the table contemplating the flame. It's clear that she has learned her lesson. Clara Peters, again, with more ingredients uh, for still lives during the century ahead, food, uh, that is butter here on top of cheese, wine, bread, pretzels, nuts, all pushed close together, a bit dryly painted, in subtle raking light. And there could be a cautionary note sounded by this particular setup that people would have picked up at the time, by the way. The, there's a Dutch proverb that says, dairy on top of dairy is the work of the devil. <laughs> Too much of a good thing, in other words, is a bad thing. Peter Klaas, um, again, um, in a picture upstairs, you can look at at your leisure, uh, the ingredients for breakfast or lunch, not especially appetizing to us as breakfast, maybe, a herring, uh, wine, beer, and a pipe with tobacco. But again, we can't be too literal. This is not a place setting or a buffet table. There is a thematic relationship, however, between these objects. And this really have to be seen up close to be believed. The slides get you fairly close to the impression that this makes, but not close enough. Common line of thought would be here that everything will be consumed here, including the matches here, the tobacco in the tin, and the coals here in the brazier, gorgeously painted, the coals in the brazier used to light the matches. The cards are tradition in Dutch art, a uh, symbol of a waste of time and an invitation to reversal of fortune, like the dice in the picture you just saw by Clara Peters, especially since the ace of spades is showing here. Smoking, though, was a relative novelty. Uh, tobacco was an import from the New World that was getting popular, but it was still associated with the lower orders, um, peasants and sailors and soldiers much as marijuana does in this country until the 1950s. Smoking was an easy target for Calvinist preachers. Uh, rumor Visser's emblem uh, makes the point clear. The killjoy uh, motto tells the story. Um, often something new, seldom something good. <coughs> the painting at the Metropolitan Museum on the right makes kind of a joke of it. That's likely to be Brower himself with the Popeyes in the middle, out slumming with his well-dressed friend, a still-life painter that we'll meet in a moment, Jan Davids de Haim. What they smoked at the time was strong stuff with mild hallucinogenic properties, which you might guess from the expression on several of the faces, including, <laughs> including uh, Brower's. This is by Peter Klaas's counterpart in Harlem, Willem Klaas Heide, who painted many of the same subjects in a somewhat cooler tonality with finer, more sharply focused technique. The light falls more emphatically here on the table and the wall behind as well, making a distinct space around it. On the white tablecloth is not just bread and oysters, but a collection of glass and metalwork that's far grander than anything we've seen so far. At the right, you get a kind of summit meeting of huge pewter flagon and tall gilt cup, silver tatsa tipped over, uh, silver standing salt here. There's a great big two-handled rumor, you could say, um, and an exquisite Venetian pitcher. Things are just a bit disordered. Some oysters and bread have already been eaten and a glass at the far right as capsized just as arbitrarily as the big Tatsa has. We see right away what these two fallen things do. They're the two sides of an implied triangle that stabilizes the right half of the picture, plays off against the unstable, disordered white cloth. And again, the plates are pushed out a bit precariously into our space. The customary game of balance is going on on the right, the crowding of those large vessels into a much heavier visual mass than anything else. But on the left, offsetting the mass, is the greater breadth of the table that exerts a kind of cantilevering force to produce equilibrium. 
And there are nice touches here, like the familiar lemon pushed to the far side and trailing down into the void. Haida began a, de a decade earlier uh, with Vanitas paintings like this one, which are meditations on music and learning and other activities that tempt people to self-importance, to pride, which may in the end be as bad for the soul as too many oysters and too much wine is for the body. Hida relies much more on subtle modulations of light and dark than on strong color. In fact, there isn't any strong color. This so-called monochrome color scheme of grays and tans was common to many Dutch artists painting these subjects, all kinds of subjects, starting around 1625 or so and on into mid-century. This began, in fact, with sea painters, um, especially this one on the upper left, Jan Porcellus, it spread to landscape and came indoors uh, for genre paintings too. One generation's preference for modesty is apt to be reversed by the next generation, of course, which is just what happened. Meanwhile, Hida, as modest as his colors were, became one of the great observers of the play of light on materials and one of the most seductive sort of conjurers of form. About the time he painted this picture, his contemporary Jan de Heem was preparing to leave Holland and go back south to Antwerp, where he'd come from. You saw him just a moment ago, the well-dressed guy with the smoking buddy, um, Brouwer. Uh, he painted this still life with some new and influential ideas that he surely got from artists in Antwerp, and I mean especially Rubens. Uh, Rubens never painted a still life, but many of his older pieces have an essential energy that comes out of a big diagonal and sometimes a spiral that comes up, formed by many figures slashing across the composition. That is actually what we see uh, in de Heim's picture, it's different forms bound together into one big slanting form that's interrupted by various things, surprising contrasts like the lemon peel here at the top and uh, the, the silver cup. Uh, which cuts across that descending diagonal. The lobster here is also something new. You could buy lobsters, uh, but they were banquet food, and they may well have been food for thought about what made them so beautiful and succulent. Uh, people knew that they were dark green and weedy when they were alive at the bottom of the sea. It was only in death that they fulfilled their potential for being beautiful and delicious. I can't prove that Dutch actually thought that, but I'm going to suggest it anyway. That's what we're free to do. The bold diagonal is possible because there's such a precarious and maybe kind of impossible pileup uh, of tipped over vessels on top of one another. You could also think in human terms about this combination of beauty and instability, which could only be temporary. The light. Uh, streams in uh, from the right across the wall and plays dramatically against the wall, giving a kind of theatrical presence to what's going on here. Uh, de Haim, as you see, uh, enters the lemon peel contest uh, one more time uh, here. Uh, this time he drapes the peel over the mouth of the cup and just lets it dangle down to tease us. Well, de Haim very soon became the greatest still life painter of his generation. By 1640, he's working on a large scale with even richer objects. This one that you saw before is eight feet wide uh, in the Louvre. It's what the Dutch have called a pronk still life. P-R-O-N-K. Pronk means ostentation. You've seen most of the stuff before, but in smaller quantities in vastly simpler settings or no settings at all, maybe just suggestions. Here, the setting is abbreviated, but it's obviously palatial. You bear in mind that not all clients for this kind of picture actually lived in palaces, large houses maybe, but in most cases, grandeur like this reflects the owner's aspirations, not his actual condition in life. This is a situation like those portraits where artists in the southern Netherlands gave their successful middle class subjects the attributes of nobility. Uh, the man here 
for example, has been given a stock attributes of the well-born and important. Uh, that is a stone, a pilaster here, uh, a parapet, beyond it a view of country property, and overhead a mighty swag of dra drapery. But this wasn't an elevated personage. It wasn't a wealthy man. He was a painter. He was a still life painter at that. And you'll see his work in a minute. Here, all that honorific apparatus frames superabundant rich vessels, which are disordered in ways that we've been talking about. The pie broken into by somebody who got there first. It's also precarious. A huge, huge Chinese plate, very expensive. Uh, tilts, sits on top of the cheese and tilts as though it were going to fall off. This is evidence again that the, what the Haim was painting was not an actual buffet, but instead a complex setup in the studio by the painter who would then pull off the miracle of painting it convincingly. There are a few extras thrown in, like the globes uh, here at the right, alluding to the knowledge of geography that made those foreign imports possible. The lute at the left speaks of cultivation and perhaps of the harmony that reigns here. By mid-century, uh, de Haim was painting banquet still lives with less pronk in their setting, but with rich vessels nevertheless. The trick was how to impose some coherence on such a terrific variety of food, fruits, vegetables, ham, lobster, which may look piled up haphazardly at first. He does it by making a large wedge of form that rises from left to right, placing that huge wine glass at its apex, and by distributing strong accents of color, red particularly, and by creating a pattern of tilted ovals of the kind we've seen before, these tilt and cascade down, echoing one another as they go. At the same time, de Haim became the most original painter of flower still lifes. But that's a story for the next lecture. Nearly on a par with de Haim, as a virtuoso, was the painter Willem von Alst. He was a generation younger than de Haim and partly formed by him. He spent 10 years abroad in France for four years and then in Florence as court painter to the Grand Duke of Tuscany. This is an astonishing seven foot high picture of an assemblage of arms and armor and other splendid metalwork that's as though he'd been commissioned by some wealthy nobleman paint his armor and trappings in his finest serving vessels, plus chain and medallion, a sign of princely favor. So do we detect a sign of transience anywhere here, a watch or a guttering candle maybe, or some note of caution about pride and worldly success? Not that I can make out. Um, I haven't seen anything like this. It looks like shameless ostentation to me. If you look at the intense blue of the table cover here, uh, you realize it's painted with ultramarine, a pigment made from ground up lapis lazuli brought all the way from Afghanistan, the rarest and most expensive pigment of all. This picture is still in the Palazzo Pitti, uh, the former Grand Ducal uh, re re uh, residence in Florence. Van Alst sets the viewpoint lower than we've been seeing, and the format is vertical, so the pile of fruit is level with us, and the glass-covered cup towers up, 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 and we see it foreshortened from below. It's a picture that seems to be all about ripeness, uh, the moment of perfection, the melon uh, ready to eat, the fruit all each glistening with droplets, the peach just beginning to split. The grape leaves here and the twisted tendrils perform a kind of acrobatics uh, on top of all this. These have turned blue, by the way, because the yellow that he'd used to mix with blue um, got uh, to get green um, had faded, something that you see in landscapes in this period, too. Van Alst is best known as a flower painter. And he's also the master of another branch of still life painting that I haven't been showing you, the so-called game piece. These pieces show dead animals 
and birds, and sometimes the weapons that brought them down. At the center uh, here is a partridge uh, hung upside down by his feet, wings splayed out in a kind of touching sort of downward flight, and two songbirds here and a kingfisher strung up. These are almost upstaged by the hunter's bag uh, made of fabulous velvet with a gold fringe and silver buckles. There's no gun here, but there's something hanging at the top next to the little birds that tells you what killed them. It's a hood with a little plume. And it would have covered the head of a falcon until it was time to let it loose. This little boy shows you. Let it loose so that it would intercept those birds in midair. At the right side, you see a picture of a party of falconers letting fly as their servants on foot at the left and at the right are holding hooded falcons for when they're needed. Hunting had been an aristocratic prerogative in Holland earlier in the century uh, when few people other than nobles had the land to, for hunting. As rich merchants were buying country estates and often buying the titles that went with them, uh, game hunting became more common and there were buyers for pictures that boasted of the stags and the boars and the birds and the prowess of the hunters that had managed to bring them down or might hope to bring them down. The details reveal um, what you see in this painting up close. Uh, Van Aal's kind of phenomenal exactness at recording all of this. The nice geometry here of the falcon's hood and even the knots uh, in the strings. And then there's the bag and its fastenings. And it's, a, it's quite a trick to be this precise without losing the variety and the life of the painted surface. This taste for hunting and game paintings came from the southern Netherlands, uh, where it was established by Rubens and the artists in, of his circle, especially this one, Franz Snyder's, whose portrait you saw a moment ago. In this picture, it's about eight feet wide, Snyder's uses the broad sweep of diagonals we've been seeing in other pictures, a kind of characteristic um, device of Flemish painters, uh, contrasting the postures and the colors uh, here of the gray uh, heron uh, and the peacock, which parallel each other but are very different. And that adds a kind of variety as, and, as well as coherence. The setting here must be a kitchen or a larder but there's wine in a cooler and glasses set out. So we're not to take this as a realistic scene of behind the scenes, let's say, of food preparation. This is more like a celebration. Rembrandt painted exactly one still life, an image uh, of dead game that once you see, you never forget. He put two peacocks together with a basket of fruit on a ledge outside a window. The shutters open so that the birds can conveniently be hung on hooks here and displayed to potential buyers. The girl is presumably minding the shop. Other painters made pictures of market sellers and their stalls, but not one with this kind of drama. Rembrandt, of course, amps it up with the light, which falls behind the birds as well as on them, and he paints the feathers with kind of energetic and forceful strokes. And there's a pathos in the blight, uh, bright uh, blood that uh, snakes uh, toward us, and also in the way that the heads are picked out by the light and cast, and are doubled really by the shadows they cast on the sill. Snyder's crossbred his game pieces with fruit and flower still lives and produced some epic uh, life-sized uh, panoramas of food and potential food servants, hungry dogs, and all in all, the good life for people who could afford it. Uh, here, the stars of the show, the star of the show is the swan uh, here, uh, with, in a graceful sort of pas de deux with uh, the deer, which is stiff with rigor mortis. One of the greatest of all Dutch still lives, I think, is this one, by a versatile painter who knew the Flemish, Flemish tradition very well. At the right a bittern hangs upside down 
its under feathers seem to explode in the light. The wild turkey nestles against the swan as though he were asleep in a kind of feather bed. Those feathers are painted with soft strokes that painters still call featherly, feathery strokes. This is one of the highest achievements of Wainix, who's found a way of painting that suggests rather than spells out the details of what he's showing. The birds are beautiful in death. While they were alive and flying and sitting or even walking, there was a beauty in their movements, but we wouldn't have seen the graceful poses and choreographed relationships that we see here. Was there some moral in all this? Did the artist want to convey something about life and death? Well, nobody's actually argued for that, and I kind of doubt it. I think this was intended to be admired. Admired as a feat of composing and painting. Another Dutch painter who reaches this height is much better known, and that's Willem Kalf, who was born in Rotterdam. And like Van Alst, he spent time in France as a young artist and practiced a particular mix of peasant genre painting and still life. These are small pictures of tumble-down atmospheric kitchens with simple vessels that he paints with a kind of crumbly, suggestive paint surfaces. And Kalf is really good at this. He's so good that a century later, his pictures were the starting point uh, for the intimate picture, uh, kitchen pieces painted by the French artist Chardin, uh, which take the possibilities in Dutch still life painting still farther. Kalf develops a, what you could call a sort of upstairs vocabulary too. Uh, this is something like the pronk still lives of Heda, but with more lavishly upholstered setting and with stronger light. And what's striking when you look up close at this picture is how broad and patchy the highlights are. They're not tiny precise touches like those of Heda and others we've seen, particularly if you look at the chain. You see something here in the, equally amazing in the background uh, here. On the left, a very freely brushed roll of bread and wine glass full of broad touches that are partly translucent. And there's also the wine glass equally freely painted, and behind it, the reflections on the silver platter. Kalf goes far beyond every other still life painter in the way he treats the metal vessels and groups the fruit with care and restrained dignity without showing off. The space around is just suggested. The vessels, though, are fabulous. Uh, an example of contemporary silversmithing, um, probably by Adam van Vianen, and a tall uh, amazing glass holder, gilt, uh, surmounted by a wine glass. After a while, you can make up that the whole setup is in a stone niche. It's not served up for you on a table, but arranged almost as though it were worthy of veneration. At the right is a pocket watch again with the usual reminder that time is passing. And if you care to think about it, so is your life. So don't get attached. Some amazing things happen in Kalf's work that we haven't seen before. Here the light bounces up from the lemons into the silver and gilt vessels, in a kind of glowing uh, flush of yellow. The effect is truthful and kind of magical at the same time. You might wonder how Kalf managed to round up these very expensive props for his pictures. Like Heda and Dehaim, he must have borrowed them in this case at least, and probably many other cases. Some of them appear in more than one painting. The drinking horn uh, in this picture, a buffalo horn with silver mounts, was actually made a century before for an Amsterdam militia company of archers whose patron saint was Saint Sebastian. And we see on the base uh, here being shot with arrows. 
the horn was a kind of talisman uh, for the militiamen, and they used it on ritual occasion during Kalf's time. It's now actually in the historical museum in Amsterdam. It's likely that Kalf made the painting, in fact, for a member of the militia. But here, Kalf combines the buffalo horn with a lobster. And you wonder, mm, could that have suggested anything? Is that more food for thought? And two creatures that had powerful defenses, after all, a hard carapace and two pointed horns both of them ending up by providing the master race with food and drink. Again, no 17th century writer instructed us to think those thoughts, but we may if we like. The painting technique, again, is striking because the highlights are scattered like stars over the shell of the lobster and in other places like those little silver figures which stand up as detached blobs. Only one other painter in the Netherlands renders light in that way. You see it uh, in Vermeer's paintings of around this time, like the milkmaid, especially in his still life on the table. The materials are different. Uh, Kalfs are shiny. Vermeer's are crumbly. But the effects produced by each man's sort of constellation of soft, blotchy highlights are very similar and um, quite uncanny. I'm going to end with this picture by Kalf, uh, which is for me the most rewarding still life of all. It deserves a close look and a thoughtful one, keeping your mind open to the associations that are aroused by what you see. I think that's the spirit in which the artist wanted us to approach the painting. And here I'm following some suggestions made by a colleague of mine, Anne Lowenthal. There's nothing new here in the inventory of objects, except maybe the red uh, carpet. Uh, carpets were used as table coverings in well-to-do houses, and in fact, you can still see them on tables in old-fashioned Dutch restaurants in smaller cities. And there's a Dutch, there's a Turkish carpet uh, in this painting upstairs by Jan Steen, a part of the furnishing of a, a sort of pseudo-respectable room used for entertaining guests and fleecing them. <coughs> Kalf's carpet is a fine Persian example that's scrunched up so we can't really make out the pattern. So it provides a kind of party game for connoisseurs who would have probably had enough clues from what we see here to recognize what they were looking at and might well identify where it came from. On the carpet is a little anthology of objects of great, great luxury. There is a Chinese porcelain bowl with a lid decorated with colorful figures modeled in relief. Sticking into the bowl is a fine silver spoon, and underneath it is a silver platter in the style of contemporary with the painting. And a lemon with an unwinding peel, the best there is as far as I'm concerned, is there together with a knife and an opal handle that obviously did the job of peeling. At the right is a large Seville orange from the Mediterranean, just touched on its shoulder with li by light. And behind the orange, the familiar Dutch rumor holding white wine. A nautilus, nautilus shell, another, in a fabulous gilt mount that I'll return to in a second. And a tall glass goblet with a cover and a base both fantastically ornamented with twisted glass canes. All in all, it's a kind of mini trade show. Imports from China, Venice, the Dutch islands of East Asia, Persia, even the tropical locales where the citrus came from. A connoisseur of Kalf's time knew all that and would have inspected the, figure on the, and the figures on the Nautilus Mount and the ones on the porcelain bowl. They're from two different traditions, the first pagan mythology of the sea represented by the merman uh, here with his twisted tail, fish tail, who's straining to hold up the shell, and the figure of the sea god, Neptune, on the top. Uh, and then there's the Old Testament and the story of Jonah, who is shown escaping from the great toothy sea creature whose belly he lived in for three days and three nights until God set him free. 
he's running from the fish toward the tall glass containing red wine, which Lowenthal suggests is an allusion to the Christian wine of salvation, and I think she's right. On the bowl, several brightly colored visitors from yet another culture, China, several of the eight immortals of Taoism, former humans who became something like saints. I'm stressing this mix of deities and saints from different belief systems in this picture because they are food for thought, and they were intended to be. They're reminders uh, of the extent uh, of the Dutch seaborne empire, the title of the great history book by Charles Boxer, the Dutch seaborne empire. They're a boast of wealth, of course, and of the power and the success that brought that wealth to the Netherlands. They're a demonstration of the wit uh, of Willem Kauf and of his tremendous prowess in making this, this seductive image. And like other still lives we've seen, there's also an advertisement, this one, of the excellent taste of the 17th century owner who bought it, lived with it, and thought about it. Well, speaking of prowess, next week I'm going to talk about the prowess of Dutch breeders of flowers, of gardeners, and of the artists who painted them. So please join us. Thank you.